We prepare to walk through 1 John 4 with the Holy Spirit. I want to share with you something I found in my reading. It was so good, I just want to quote it in its entirety. In the gold rush days in California, a simple Greek word became the slogan for thousands of prospectors when they cried out, Eureka. Eureka is a Greek word that means, I have found it. The term meant instant riches, early retirement, and a life of rest. Would-be prospectors quickly learned, however, that not everything that appeared to be gold actually was. Riverbeds and rock quarries were full of golden specks that were worthless. This fool's gold, as it came to be called, was iron pyrite. And miners had to be careful to distinguish it from the real thing. Their livelihood depended on it. Experienced miners could usually distinguish pyrite from gold simply by looking at it. But in some cases, the distinction was not so clear. So they developed tests to discern what was genuine from what was false. One test involved biting the rock because real gold is softer than the human tooth, whereas fool's gold is harder. A second test involved scraping the rock on a piece of white stone because true gold leaves a yellow streak where fool's gold leaves a greenish black. In either case, a miner relied on tests to authenticate his find. His fortune and future depended on the results of that test. Well, my friends, as was true in the gold rush, just because something glitters doesn't mean it's good. Christians need to be wary of what one writer calls spiritual fool's gold. We've got to be careful to not accept it as true without first testing it to see if it's real. If it fails the test, we should discard it as false and in our love warn others about it. California gold prospectors would cry Eureka only when what they had found was proven true. Did you hear that? We too, as seekers of truth, want to cry a spiritual Eureka. And let's see if he can do this. The word known as, there we go. When we strike it rich with the riches and grace that's found in our Lord Jesus Christ, hallelujah is the word to use. It's a cry of passion, awe, relief, and wonder. It may be the only single word appropriate when we discover and are stunned by the eternal riches of Christ provided for us by our heavenly Father. However, just like the 49ers, if you will, the New Testament issues a repeated warning throughout its pages, which in essence is beware. There's a lot of spiritual fool's gold out there. And the problem is it looks and sounds like the real thing. It can be found in books. It can be found on the radio and on television. It can be found in the church. And so throughout both Old and New Testament, the challenge is be on guard. My friends, people send me books all the time because they're excited about what they've read and they've asked me to read them and I have to, unfortunately, when I've read them, tell them I'm not all that excited about this book. There's some spiritual fool's gold in it. And what I want to share with you today is this warning of the New Testament to be careful should be heeded in our modern technological world more than any age previous. Virtually anyone with a computer can become a blogger and a blogger is, in effect, a teacher. And so with so many teachers out there, the potential for error to be mixed with truth has risen exponentially. And the need to guard and to test whether something is true or not has greatly expanded in accordance with the rise in that error. What I have said to you just now can sound so critical. It can sound so harsh, so narrow-minded, so self-righteous. And I would readily admit that. This has been a common criticism of biblical Christianity throughout the ages, that it is so exclusive, to which we should declare unashamedly, yes and no. Yes and no. First of all, Christianity is not exclusive. Jesus died for the whole world. And the reason he did so is heralded loudly and clearly in the 16th verse of John chapter 3. For God so loved, what? The elect? 
No, what does it say? The world that he gave his only begotten son. And Jesus would later add in the gospel of John that when the son of man is lifted up, he will draw all men to himself. There's nothing exclusive about that. Jesus has opened wide the doors of heaven and all men can listen to his drawing voice and come to him and find life and salvation in his finished work. So let's say a resounding no. Christianity is not exclusive. If you come to God on his terms. You see in that same verse, John 3.16 God so loved the world that he gave his son, he finished it by saying that whosoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. There's the exclusion. You have to choose. Jesus made it very clear when he said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. Narrow-minded, exclusive, absolutely. Because he is the only one as the God-man who has provided an offering for sin that could be sufficient for the sins of all men in all history. No mere man could die for another man. He might be able to die for one man. He will never be able to die for the whole world. That's what Romans teaches. So this heartbeat, this core of our faith that there's one way to God is what 1 John has been all about. In this little five-chapter book, we have seen John proclaim a contrast between right and wrong, truth and error, good and evil. And let's be honest, if you've been with us in this study, and not, where have you been? Just kidding. <laughs> but if you've been with us in this study, you will readily admit that the Apostle John has been very, very strong. And I trust all of us have seen that strength. He has to be. Because men's eternal destinies is at stake. But throughout the book, equally as herald, he has heralded right and wrong, truth and error, he has also heralded that the motive or basis behind his declaration is love. Because we love, we have to speak the truth, otherwise men die in their sins. The very nature of love demands that we do what is right and good and best for others, which means we exalt the truth and expose the lies. Because Jesus said so succinctly, when you come to know the truth, it will set you free. And by default, that means if we believe lies, we'll remain in bondage and we'll remain lost. So carrying the banner of truth, which exposes the lies of the enemy, is an errand of real life. And it's got to be taken seriously or else the church will be in danger of losing its light and men will perish in their sin. John, way back in 90 AD when he wrote this book, gave the marching orders for the church until Jesus Christ returns. Herald the truth. Herald it without question. But make sure it's tempered with love. Men will not listen to the truth if they do not believe they are loved. This is the passion of 1 John. As we prepare to tear into chapter 4, let's pray. Father, we need to understand why John wrote and get in our heart and mind the necessity of heralding truth. We need to embrace the love that guided his heart so that we will have the courage to do that. So this is a tremendous chapter for us. Will you capture our heart and our mind? And may the captured heart and mind influence the will that we will fulfill our calling to love others enough to tell them the truth. Even if it makes them angry, even if it wounds them, even if it exposes that they've believed lies. Father, this is too important to do otherwise. So we pray for the courage of the lion of, the Judah, to, of Judah to be expressed through us while tempered with the gentleness of the lamb. So that's our prayer in Jesus' name. We thank you for it in, in his name. Amen. All right, let's look at 1 John chapter 4, verse 1. Look at the very first word. What is it? Beloved. That single word comes to you and I the moment we read it with a double emphasis. First of all, as a reminder of who we are. Throughout this room, embrace it. You are the beloved. You are the ones loved by God. 
We are cherished. We are treasured. But it also comes secondly with a responsibility. As the loved ones, we're to complete the circle and love God and love others. So this twofold command comes in then from verse 1. What is it? Because we are the beloved, look what he says. Believe not every spirit. Don't read that casually. That's a shocking statement. Why didn't he say, believe not every word, or believe not every teacher, or believe not every speaker? He said, do not believe every, what? Spirit. He calls to our attention to go beyond the words that we hear to the source behind those words. What he's saying is potentially every speaker could be carrying with them an evil spirit. Paul warned in 1 Timothy 4 against false teachers calling what they taught in actuality the doctrine of demons. So we have human men and women being influenced by the enemy to communicate error and unwillingly many times propagate that error. He wants us to understand that there's a spirit of disobedience, the prince of the power of air that influences people. So Papa John... <laughs> says to his little kids, you just got that. <laughs> Papa John says to his little kids, don't be naive. Look before you leap. Don't just believe everything you hear. And in our day, especially because it was found on the internet. Test those spirits, verse 1 says. Critique and scrutinize what you hear. One writer said, read like a watchdog. Listen like a watchdog. Boy, in our household, that really knit my heart immediately. Not too long ago, we got a new little addition to the house, which is no longer a little addition. We have a big, young Rottweiler. And when he hears a noise, when movement is noticed in his domain, his eyes fix, his ears perk up, and if he detects danger, he has a big boy growl and one hellacious bark. <laughs> That's how we're to be as listeners. Eyes fixed, ears alert. But that begs the question, how do we do that? What's the test? What are the guidelines? Well, look at verse 1, what it says. It says, many have already gone out. Not some. Many. What is he saying? You've got to do this. You cannot not do it. The danger is too great. We're not dealing with just a few false teachers out there motivated, motivated by the enemy spirit. There are prolific. So John provides us three main guidelines. And, and notice this. This is very important. The litmus test is not the charisma of the teacher. My mentor, John MacArthur, I'll never forget, he was telling me that one guy came up to him one day and said, you know, I've been coming to your church for two years. And John said, well, that's exciting. How long have you been a Christian? He said, oh, I'm not. He said, what do you, what do you mean? How can you be coming here when you're not a Christian? He goes, I just love your excitement. <laughs> it's not the charisma of the teacher, gang. It's not how handsome he is. Thankfully, <laughs> it's not how funny or eloquent he is, nor is it the titles and degrees he holds or the beauty of the building or especially in our culture, the size of the crowd. Listen, the flesh builds big things. Have you ever heard of the Tower of Babel? Did Jesus build a big organization? It was 12 people. And one of them ran, you had 11 just because something's big doesn't mean you're going to find truth there. In fact, the reality is narrow is the way. You might look for something smaller, have a greater potential of finding truth. Because truth divides. So look at the three main guidelines. First one is found in verse 2. By this, look at the language. Let me make this easy for you. Do they confess Jesus come in the flesh? Do they confess Jesus as the God man? Or are they anti-Christ against Jesus instead of Jesus? The one you're listening to, are you hearing that he was a great man, a humanitarian, a good example, a wonderful teacher? Those Wonderful descriptions, my friends, are actually detracting from who he really is. 
He is only the great man and the humanitarian. In fact, humanitarian, I wouldn't even use that. Sounds as if there's great love coming from man. It only comes from God, as we're going to see. Good example, wonderful teacher. He is all those things only because he is God wrapped up in a man. He is Lord, he is Savior, he is life. So do you hear Jesus as the name above every name? I put it this way. Do they have obsessive lips? What do you mean? Are they obsessed with Jesus? Do you hear Jesus and hear Jesus a lot? Or do you just hear Jesus at the end of a prayer in a formula? In Jesus' name, Roger over and out. Do they have, do, is Jesus consume them? Is he the exalted name above all names? It has to be found on the lips. Secondly, verses 4 and 5. Do they have transforming lives? Notice I didn't say transform because we're all in a process. Right? Paul said, I press on. Haven't arrived yet. But do they have lives that are being conformed to the message of the lips? Are they growing free of what we saw earlier in this book? The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. John puts it this way. Are they an overcomer? Do you see righteousness in them? Do you see goodness in them? Do you see love in them? Are they finding that one who is in them is greater than he that's in the world? Are they living in accordance with the reality that their dad is bigger than the earthly dad? Remember that as a kid? My dad's bigger than your dad. Do they live as if their dad is bigger than the dad of the world? Steve Pettit put it this way. Most sermons I hear these days are nothing more than a pep rally for the soul instead of a call to draw life from the Savior. Those are strong words. Maybe we need to say that again. Most sermons I hear these days are nothing more than a pep rally for the soul instead of a call to draw life from the Savior. You can spot a false teacher because Jesus is hard to find on their lips, but also in their lives. Thirdly, do they have obedient hearts? Look at verse 6. Jesus dwelling within them. This is the one who is from God who listens to the truth. What did Jesus say? My sheep hear my voice. Is that all? What did he add? And they follow. They're obedient. The one who is not from God doesn't listen to truth. And listening to truth is the root of obedience. The word obedience is an outward action that begins in the heart. The literal Greek word is hupakuo. We translate it to obey. But it actually means to listen under. What I hear, I do. Isn't that what Jesus said? And we walk the same path that he walked. I do only as my heavenly father tells me. Well, if you're going to hear him tell you, you've got a heart that has to listen. A false teacher doesn't have that heart. In Acts chapter 17, Paul dialogued with the people at Athens and they refused to hear. I know what it says, but. And so John says, remember, church. Remember, beloved ones, there are many liars out there and much spiritual fool's gold. Test the spirits with those three things. The lips of the teacher, the life of the teacher, and the heart of the teacher. And if it doesn't center on Jesus, be very, very careful what you hear. Watch out for lies and liars, verses 1 through 6. And then he shifts gears. Look at verse 7. Beloved, there it is again. We pointed this out last week. Again and again and again he calls us the beloved of God. You're loved. You're loved. You are loved. Did you know that you're loved? Hallelujah. Why so many reminders? I started meditating on that in my office this week. Maybe because we need to be reminded. Maybe because there's so many bad things that happen in a fallen world that we can doubt his love. Maybe because we've watched too much Fox News. 
Maybe we need to learn this about ourselves so that we don't doubt it. That's why we have to hear it over and over. Maybe because once we know this about ourselves, we can in turn become vessels of encouragement to others and let them know their love too. Maybe to remind us that when we herald truth and expose error, that when we're doing that, it's actually with a motive of love. I want to give you a fascinating thought. As I meditated, this hit me. If I were to ask you what the great love chapter in the Bible is, what would you say? 1 Corinthians 13, right? I have little doubt that many or most of you would say that. And I would have been one of you. So I went back to 1 Corinthians 13 and I looked at the, the, the passage and the word love is found eight times in 13 verses. Let's say that again. Eight times in 13 verses. That's almost every other verse. Truth, love, truth, love, truth, love, truth, love. Wonderful. 1 Corinthians 13 heralds love so beautifully that it's become standard reading at weddings. And it should be. One author called it a passage fit for framing. You might even have it in your house. But by having this study, I've been afforded the opportunity to dig into 1 John 4 like never before. And I believe the love chapter distinction belongs to this chapter. Not to 1 Corinthians 13. By the way, this is the third time in four chapters that John reminds us to love. And throughout the book, he reminds us we are the beloved. He has increased in passion and intensity with every reference to love. To the point that here in 1 John chapter 4, he uses the word love 21 times. That's every verse it could work out to. Paul wrote 1 Corinthians. John wrote 1 John 4. Fascinating. What is John known as? What does he call himself? The disciple whom Jesus loved. Did John think he was somebody extra special? Mm -mm, I don't believe that. What I believe happened is he never got over the awe and wonder that the living holy God of the universe who is a consuming fire, could some love somebody the likes of him. Stunned. That's how I would define the Apostle John. In fact, I put this on the screen for you because I wanted you to see this. This is how I would dramatize it. See if it get up there. He loves me. Only it's like this. He, can you believe it? He the living, consuming fire of the universe, that one, the one who strikes terror in the hearts of men who don't know him, that one loves, oh my goodness, has set his eyes on me for no reason other than that he's chosen to set his eyes on me and love me without expecting anything in return. And he does that to me? We're the beloved Agape toy, it means loved by God. Therefore, verse 7, love one another. Because love is from God. He's the source. And therefore, everyone who loves is proving that he's been born from God and proving that he knows God. Love is a circle, not a triangle. Love, the source, loves the object, the beloved, who then receives the love. And if it stops there, that's not love. That's called selfishness. That's called being a consumer. If it's really love, the love not only gets experienced, but gets expressed. It not only gets received, but it gets released. And completes the circle. And so verse 8, if you don't love, it's proof that you don't know God. We know God, verses 9 and 10, therefore we know love because it was manifested to us in Jesus who was sent into the world to remove our sins. In the cross, God says, see how much I love you? I love you this much. And he stretched out his arms and died. And if you ever doubt his love, if life gets hard, don't look presently at the circumstance you're going through. Look back 2,000 years ago to the greatest demonstration of love the world will ever see. 
Don't base your love on what you're experiencing. Base the fact that your love on what he did. John says that's proof that we are loved. So that, verses 9 and 10, purpose clause, we might live through him. He died to save us from our sin. He lives in us to save us from ourselves. And what he did in doing so was he transformed us into lovers as well. So please hear me. As human beings, our ability to love does not begin with us. Our ability to love begins with God. He is the source of that love. Without God, man cannot truly love. That's why the Greek language, I think with all my heart, that's why God chose to write in Koine Greek because it was the most explicit, specific language that ever hit the earth. There, see, in, in, in English, what do, what do we say? I say, I love Samson, my Rottweiler. I love ice cream. I love my wife. What have I just done? I put loving Janet on a par with loving the dog. See, in English, love is vague. But in Koine Greek, there's actually four words. There's phileo, brotherly love. There's storge, family love. There's arao, romantic love. But none of those words would work in the New Testament to define the love from God. And so the New Testament writers, under the influence of the Holy Spirit, took a, a very obscure word, agape, and brought it into the forefront to use it as the word, the only word that could define love from God. Unconditional love. The love that man cannot do apart from God because we put conditions. Agape deals not only with the action but with the motive. Let me illustrate it for you. What does the world do if a guy brings flowers to his girl? Man, what a great guy. And all the women get envious and elbow their husband. Why didn't you bring me flowers? What does God say? God doesn't necessarily say great guy. He says, why did you do it? See, he deals with motive. What was the basis? What was the reason? And so I quickly answer, well, well I love her. And this Holy Spirit who discerns all things and knows me better than I know myself says, that's true, Frank. That's about 78% of your motive. Well, Holy Spirit, what's the other 22 well, you want her to love you back. Oh, so it's manipulation. Yeah, it's tied in there. Only God in us, my friends, enables us to love with the pure motive of seeking the highest and best for another, independent of the return on our investment. Verse 11, beloved, there it is again. <laughs> Can you hear it, beloved? Can you dare to believe it? He loves me. He loves me independent of who I am. Oh, thank you. Come sit in the front row. The rest of you front row seaters, get, you just missed it. He loves me in spite of what I've done. He loves me in spite of what I'm going to do. Because he is love. That means he loves because of who he is, not because of who we are. Can you hear it? You are loved for free. It's the direct antithesis of religion, which says you're loved if you perform. If God, verse 11, so loved us, Ought we not love one another? Isn't that just an only right? Verse 12, no one's seen God at any time. Even when they saw Jesus, the glory was veiled. And so the world doesn't see God. And John takes that and he says, but don't you understand? When they see us love, they see God. We're the living letters, Paul said, to the world. When his love is perfected in us, that means completed, finished. When it does what it's supposed to do, which is transform each and every one of us into a lover. 
verse 13. There are two wonderful byproducts of this. One is that this proves who we are. How many people in here ever doubt their salvation? Okay, a few honest people. Sometimes I drive home and I go, Lord, is all this really true? You've never done that? The very fact that I've been transformed to love like I never loved before, John says, is assurance that the gospel is true. But I don't love all that well. No, but you love better than you used to. Maybe you're not all that you yet should be, but you're not what you were either. Yeah, hallelujah to that. Your spouse, your wife probably says that even louder. (laughs) The second assurance that this gives us is assurance for the future, verses 16 through 18, when the judgment comes. We don't have to fear that day. Christian, do away with your fear of the second coming. I have met Christians who don't want Jesus to come back because they're afraid of the second coming. We all have to appear before the judgment seat. Don't lift that verse out of its context. It's a context of reward, not punishment or discipline. Your sin is not going to be brought up at the throne of judgment. It's not. He said it's fast as far as the east is from the west. Get over yourself. Get over your sin and become overwhelmed with the finished work of Christ. Our sin is gone. There's no judgment for our sin because it's already been judged in Christ. Talk about love. Romans 5 says Jesus did this. God pouring, shedding abroad the love of God in our hearts. 2 Corinthians says that we're earthen vessels. And so it's like we got under the faucet of love and he just filled us full and he filled us overflowing. This is the love that he has for you when he died for you while you were still an enemy. If that's true of you as an enemy, how much more so is it true when you're his kid? Because we love our kids. (laughs) Where did we get that? (laughs) I laid down my life for my babies. Wouldn't you? Now John at this point in this love chapter is almost out of words. As As he just tries every way he can to describe and define the overwhelming love of God. I see him scrambling for his words at this point in verses 19 through 20, but there are no other words. He can't find them. There's nothing more to say. So you know what he does? He he repeats himself and says it again. (laughs) And it's almost like he's grabbing you and going, do you hear what I've said? (laughs) I'm going to tell you again because I don't think you heard what I said. Verses 19 and 20, we love And the very fact that when you see that is proof that he loved us first. This is so assured, such a reality, such a profound cause and effect, such a deep work of the Holy Spirit that he says, if you say you love God and don't love others, you're a liar. Did you notice the word choice? He didn't say you lied. He said you're a liar. That's identity. What's he saying? If you claim to love God and don't love your brothers and sisters in Christ and love others, you're actually lying. You really don't know God. So before you try to love, maybe you first better receive love from his hand and enter into a relationship with him through the finished work of Jesus Christ. If you do not love your brother who you see, verse 20, how can you love God? whom you don't see. Verse 21, he wraps it up. This is it. This is the the one commandment we have. The marching orders as a Christian that we have from God. You know, people always say, what's the will of God for my life? What's the will of God? Love. (laughs) 
with a megaphone. Love. That's the will of God. And that prompts a question, at least in my brain. If love is such a powerful, transforming reality, and it is, why does it have to be commanded? You ever thought about that? I think it's because of our humanity and the design of God and the very nature of love. Love doesn't just happen. Love, as we've seen in the New Testament, is an action. It's a choice of the will. It's a verb, not a noun. So it's a choice to treat another in the highest and best way possible, regardless of how they treat us in return. And one of the things we have to admit about the Bible is that God will never, ever violate our will. He will never treat us like robots. We have free choice. And we must choose to love. Love must be given as a choice of the will perpetually, or it will be nothing more than a nebulous sentimentality that can wax and wane like the ebb and flow of the tide based on the circumstances it finds itself in. Let me say that again. Love must be expressed. It must be given as a choice of the will perpetually, or it will be nothing more than a nebulous sentimentality that can wax and wane like the ebb and flow of the tide based on the circumstances it finds itself in. May I dare illustrate this with little kids? You know, little Joey, you did a bad thing. And I'm going to have to discipline you. No, Daddy, no, Daddy, I love you, I love you, I love you. Discipline, I hate you, Daddy. The love has ebbed and flowed based on the circumstances. And may I suggest to you that all we are as adults is little kids that got big who are prone to do the same thing. We choose based on circumstances. And when circumstances are not good, we don't choose all that often. And when we don't choose all that often, love wanes. Let me put it to you this way. If I had won Janet's heart, betrothed her to myself, expressed my covenant love to her in a public ceremony, and given her my ring, but then I refused to talk to her ever again, what would happen? The fire that was once in the human heart will flicker and die. Jesus himself said in Matthew 24, men's love grows cold. To the church in Revelation chapter 2, Jesus spoke to that great church at Ephesus which had reproved false teachers and proclaimed sound doctrine. He said these words. To the church at Ephesus, I have this one thing against you. You lost your first love. You did all the right things except one. And it was the supreme thing. You failed to love. What good is all that doctrine if there is no love? Those are vaguely familiar words. They're found in the second best chapter on love, 1 Corinthians 13. This is what it says. If I speak with the tongues of men and angels, wow, but don't have love? I'm just a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. It's just a bunch of noise. If I have the gift of prophecy and know all mysteries and knowledge, and if I have all faith, well, without faith, it's impossible to please God. That's a biggie, isn't it? If I have all faith but don't have love, I'm nothing. If I give all my possessions to feed the poor, boy, that's sacrificial, isn't it? And if I surrender my body to be burned, what if I become a martyr? See the hyperbole? Which one of us is willing to be a martyr? 
If I do that and don't have love, it profits me nothing. And so now, Paul says, abide faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. And so the fire that is love is an exercise, it's a choice, it's an action, it's a verb. I want to invite you to stand as we proclaim this. Passage in its entirety. Beloved, loved ones, let us love one another for love is from God. And everyone that loves is proving that they're born of God and and that they know God. He that loves not doesn't know God, for God is love. In this was manifested the love of God to us, that God sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. And herein is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to remove our sins. And so, beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. For no man has seen God at any time. But if we love one another, God dwells in us and his love is perfected and completed in us and others will be able to see it and thereby see God. By this, we know that we dwell in him and he in us because he's given us the spirit. That's how we can love. The person of love lives within. And we have seen now and testify that the Father sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. Whosoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwells in him and he dwells in God. And we have known and believed the love that God has towards us. God is love. And he that dwells in love dwells in God and God dwells in him. And herein is our love made perfect that we may have boldness in the day of judgment because as he is, so we are in him. There's no room for fear anymore. It's done. There is no fear in love. The perfect love casts out fear because fear has punishment and he that fears is not made perfect in love. We love because he first loved us. If a man says, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. For he that loves not his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? And this commandment we have from him, that he who loves God loves his brother also. You know, in the New Testament, that's what they did with these letters. They read them in the public assembly. Powerful to read it in its entirety, isn't it? Would you be seated? We're going to celebrate communion. Men, are, go ahead and come. Start passing that if you would. And hear me, please. Listen, listen, please. What we are about to do is a radical, radical thing. Say, Frank, what do you mean? In this table, we're celebrating death. You ever thought about that? That's unheard of in our society. When there's a death, we mourn, we grieve. We try to avoid death. We don't want to talk about death. If you go to a funeral in a spirit of celebration, that's ugly and mean, isn't it? It would be rude and insensitive. But not so in biblical Christianity. We have a table that we're going to partake of that's instituted by Jesus himself where the main purpose behind it is actually to celebrate a death. See how radical that is? How can we do that? Have you read Isaiah 53? Have you seen the grief? Have you seen the sorrow, the humiliation, the torture? How do you celebrate that? Because 1 John 3, 16 says the motive behind it was love. So we celebrate a death only because we're celebrating love. Love that came first from God, then to us. So as the men pass among you, I want to give you this verse to meditate and rejoice over. 1 John 3, 16. We know love by this, 
that he laid down his life for us. Celebrate his death. Don't mourn today. Because if you really celebrate it, you're celebrating love. Greatest love that can ever be found. A love that lays down its life for another.
Beloved ones, before we dismiss, I have a final thought. First, let me share with you the prayer room will be open. Just center out, head out the center aisles, turn left. There'll be people there if you have a need or a burden. I ask you to meditate on that first John 3.16. We know love by this, that he laid down his life for us. There is a second half of the verse that is equally important. And we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. We're to complete the circle of love. Let the love of God be perfected in us that we in turn would become the lovers. So be it in Jesus' name. Go be the church.